I'm very delighted to welcome you to this panel. It follows uh, perfectly after the other. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Um, I spent 25 years at the Wall Street Journal, much of it uh, covering uh, and tracking the democratic changes uh, of Europe, uh, reunification of Germany, enlargement of NATO and the European Union. Uh, to have representatives of Georgia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia sitting here before us leads perfectly into this panel. Uh, Bronislaw Goremek, who probably is the person who taught me uh, most of what I know about democratic change, uh, once said to me, uh, the emergence of democracy as a universally accepted form of government is the most important development of our century. Then he said, but another lesson of the century is that democracy is by no means a process that goes from triumph to triumph. And that's what we're seeing today. Um, I'm very delighted that we will have uh, uh, three panelists uh, today, uh, and then an honorary panelist in the front row of the, uh, uh, who I'll turn to after the, after the panelists make their opening interventions. Uh, Tamika Tilleman, a senior advisor for civil society and emerging democracies at U.S. Department of State. Jerzy Pomianowski, uh, the uh, executive director of the European, and the, uh, the new European Endowment for Democracy. And of course, a, uh, a long time, uh, senior official of the foreign ministry working on these issues. I'm very happy that Steve Hadley, uh, former national security advisor uh, of uh, President George W. Bush, a uh, longtime senior official of U.S. governments and also an executive director of the Atlantic Council Board, has joined us. Uh, and then I hope uh, after we finish our first round uh, that we can turn also to one of the people whose work in these fields I, I respect uh, a huge amount, and that's the former uh, foreign minister of, of Germany, uh, Joschka Fischer, uh, who will raise the first question and maybe re respond a little bit to what he's heard up here. Uh, but let's get right into it. Um, we're going to have a conversation. Uh, I think the Wrocław Global Forum at its best is also a place that tries to, tries to get us into action, tell us what we ought to do. And of course, on this uh, panel, it actually talks a lot about that word is the future of U.S.-European cooperation. What do we mean by that? Uh, what is the context for that? What are we up against? And so let me start with Tamika. And I wonder if you could tell me a little bit uh, of how you see the current context uh, of democracy promotion, democracy, democracy advancement, uh, as you look at it from the State Department. Well, thank you very much, Fred. It's great to be here and uh, really appreciate the work of the Council and all of the organizers in, in making this event possible. As we survey the landscape of democracy support and uh, democracy promotion, uh, this is really the best of times and the worst of times. And I would highlight three fundamental changes that have occurred over the last few years. Uh, first, since 1989, we've witnessed more than 40 transitions to democracy. And this process has created a new reservoir of expertise that, if we are able to tap into it effectively, has the potential to fundamentally remake the nature of the way we conduct democracy support in many countries around the world. How many transitions do you say? Over 40, 40. at this point. And, and again, if we look back to 1989, at the time, there were really only a handful of democracies that were engaged in the work of democracy support. And that is changing very rapidly. Thanks to the leadership of countries like Poland, you see a new class of nations that are committed to these values and willing to work to advance them uh, in other contexts around the world. Uh, and that's a very significant change. The second new development is the emergence of platforms and technologies uh, that are allowing us to leverage some of that new expertise and allowing us to work on a multilateral basis to advance democracy. Uh, and I'd highlight just a few. One of them is an initiative that was co-founded by Bronislav Goremek, who you mentioned earlier, and Mad uh, Madeleine Albright. The Community of Democracies, of course, has its uh, permanent secretariat and headquarters in Warsaw. And over the last two and a half to three years, again, thanks to leadership from Poland, Lithuania, and a number of other countries, it's emerged as a key platform for multilateral efforts to advance democracy around the world, not only due to partnerships within the Euro-Atlantic community, uh, but also by leveraging the expertise of emerging democracies in places like Latin America and East Asia, uh, which is going to be critical to the success of our future endeavors. 
We're also seeing initiatives like the new European Endowment for Democracy uh, and also projects like the LEND Network for leaders engaged in new democracies uh, that are harnessing technology and uh, multilateral tools in such a way uh, that have the potential uh, to make the, the work of democracy support far more effective uh, and I think far more impactful. And we can talk about that a little can, bit can more Can you just later. briefly in a sentence or two tell us what the LEND Network is? Sure, this is a, an initiative of the community of democracy that is co-chaired by the United States and Estonia. And it grew out of a realization on the part of Secretary Clinton that many of the key leaders in countries undergoing transitions right now were being pulled out of jails where they were political prisoners or universities where they were academics, but they had never had experience setting up or reforming a government ministry previously. And of course, there's no owner's manual for how to go about this work. And so we got together with key leaders from about 20 countries that had been through successful transitions, many of them in Central Europe, but also people like the former Chief Justice of South Africa's Supreme Court, who rewrote that nation's constitution, or the former head of the Chilean army, who led the transition to civilian rule and then brought in technology partners like Google and a number of non-US firms to build out a technology platform that allows for real-time voice, video, and text communication with translation. And this has allowed us to overcome many of the logistical and linguistic barriers that previously have curtailed our ability uh, to engage in democracy support. And then we're now connecting these key leaders from countries that have been through transitions with key leaders in countries that are in the midst of transitions. For example, leaders within the network are at the moment providing feedback on current drafts of the Tunisian constitution and using the benefits of their perspective uh, to help leaders in that country figure out what's worked and what hasn't worked in the course of past transitions. And while, of course, there will never be an owner's manual for new democracies, we do see this as something resembling tech support uh, for setting up a new democracy, and we hope that it's the beginning of a broader trend. The, the final point that I would mention uh, as we look at this landscape uh, is the tremendous pushback, unfortunately, uh, that we are witnessing in countries around the world uh, against these efforts and against civil society, which, uh, as, as you spoke about, uh, is really at the core of democratization. And, and this is the worst of times from the best of times. Precisely. Right. And uh, you know, as we sit here on this panel today, there are 30 countries that are considering new restrictive measures uh, that would limit the ability of civil society to operate freely, uh, and 24 nations that are looking at new rules that would restrict the ability of international donors to support civil society. Uh, and this has the potential, unfortunately, uh, to make all of these promising nascent efforts much more complicated in the future. Uh, and what we've seen, sadly, uh, is that uh, authoritarian and semi-authoritarian governments have gotten very good at exchanging worst practices, and democracies haven't always kept pace uh, when it comes to the exchange of best practices. Uh, and we're going to have to get better at that going forward. Thank you, Tamika. Let me turn to Yerzi. I mean, uh, for everyone in the audience, this is real time, and this is very current. Uh, if you just look at the news today, we have Iranian elections taking place today. Uh, you have uh, demonstrators going back out on the, uh, into Taksim Square in Turkey. What kind of response uh, will the democratically elected government there take to this kind of situation? You have the situation in Syria where the U.S. is uh, talking about now uh, uh, arming the opposition. So th 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 there are real situations that, uh, that, uh, that these gentlemen are dealing with uh, even, as, even as we speak. Uh, Yossi, I wonder if you could uh, pick up from Tomaika uh, uh, with really the same questions he's answering, but then also what can we do together uh, as the U.S. and Europe, and what role will the, uh, uh, your new European Endowment for Democracy play in all of this? Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. I'm extremely pleased to be here in Wroclaw and to talk a bit of, uh, first, my, my future work, and secondly, of uh, what we have done uh, with Tomaika um, quite recently during... Uh, last uh, two, three years. Uh, I, I am specifically referring to the formal dialogue that Poland and U.S. established a dialogue on democracy support between two governments. Actually, uh, the Poland is the only partner of U.S. to have formalized this kind of dialogue. I think it is a very strong signal because uh, uh, if we look uh, transatlantic dimension, uh, and, uh, and the way Europe's dialogue with the United States, I think something is missing. And exactly this element is missing from the overall dialogue between Europe 
and America. So I think the Polish-American experience can serve now as a kind of pilot for, uh, for really a, a new phase of, of coordination and transatlantic co coordination that can be uh, specifically in, in, in this area, democracy support. So s mentioning this as a kind of guiding uh, experience, uh, let, me, let me say what is the, the very guiding uh, slogan of the European Endowment for Democracy, because that is also lessons that we have learned over years of, of democracy, uh, democracy support. Democracy definitely cannot be imported or imposed from outside. That's a very easy guiding slogan, which today sounds obvious, but it was not that obvious 5, 10, 15, or 20 years ago. So we, we, we have to stick to it in, in all our uh, activities and then think uh, how we can uh, uh, transform into the practice this very specific uh, uh, idea. And at the same time, when we say that democracy cannot be imposed from outside, we, we have to add immediately another important uh, uh, idea, that even one person fighting for democracy in its own country cannot be left without support. And that's our mission and the moral obligation. And here, building on these values, uh, U.S. And, and European perspectives are very, very alike. So we, uh, we, we should uh, be not ashamed by addressing those key moral principles, both in our policies and uh, in our technologies of, of uh, uh, democracy support. So in this, uh, in this context, I believe we should also be um, very much aware what were the uh, mistakes from the past and how we can be again entrapped with the similar uh, policy issues uh, um, nowadays. If we look into uh, North Africa, uh, newly uh, born revolutions and, uh, and the drive for democracy, for change, uh, we have all the time a group of analysts, researchers, politicians that are trying to, to bring uh, the very same old perspective saying, look, uh, we don't know what outcome we have out of those revolutions. It wouldn't it be better to, to stick to stability and security uh, on the cost of democracy, human rights? Because those countries are different, those cultures are different, Islam doesn't work with democracy, and so on and so on. I think this is a very, very wrong approach, and that is the kind of uh, idea, uh, Polish experience, Poland and the new part of Europe is bringing to the floor, saying this cannot be the case. I mean, we, we cannot say today there is a country not ready for democracy, there is a culture not ready for democracy, there is a re religion not ready for democracy. So from, from this point of view, uh, I would say there is still a lot of work between Europe and US to set up a framework of more formalized dialogue and coordination. Uh, I think uh, we are now uh, getting more mature uh, to um, address similarities than differences in approaches. They are differences as well. So uh, it's better to, to point them and to, and, to, and to coordinate in order to achieve better results. So I think uh, uh, what I would say and how I see the European Endowment for Democracy, it's like uh, an additional invitation and a proof that time has raped enough to, uh, um, uh, to start uh, uh, this kind of dialogue. It's not, it's not uh, a, 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 an, an accident that European Endowment for Democracy is created, and the proximity to the name to the National Endowment for Democracy, by all means, is not accidental. It also reflects uh, a drive to, uh, to find a ways how we can do things together, but differently. So definitely, endowment, uh, European Endowment for Democracy is not going to be a copy of National Endowment for Democracy. But I do expect, and I have this confirmation already from Karl Gershkam and many friends uh, across Atlantic, that they would like to cooperate. They would like to see this innovative approach from Europe, adding new elements to its own infrastructure for democracy support. They would like to build on this and, and to find the ways that we can uh, do things together and do things better. So that's the, 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 the joint message. Now about more uh, what's going on uh, uh, around us, especially in the region that endowment will operate. 
so uh, Eastern Partnership and North Africa. Here, uh, because the, the, the geographic mandate of the endowment is a uh, uh, European neighborhood as it is defined by the European neighborhood policy, so 15 countries around Europe. Uh, of course, the situation in, in every, uh, uh, each of them is, is different. We will differently act vis-a-vis -vis our Belarusian friends. We will differently uh, uh, act vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Moldova, or, or, or Georgia, and differently in Egypt, Tunis, Libya, uh, or, or, or Algeria, and, and Morocco. So, of course, taking all those contexts into, into account, uh, first thing is that European Endowment for Democracy as multinational effort and NGO as a formal uh, legal entity will not necessarily see the governments as a counterpart. We would rather talk directly to the society, to the civil society. We will deal directly with the civil society. And, and saying this, we should, uh, we should understand that um, in Europe, when we have this multinational uh, joint effort as endowment is, not everybody shares a similar approach. If we look, for example, democracy support of the French system, uh, France is number 20 uh, if we look into ratio between overall development budget, development cooperation budget, and the democracy assistance. It's number 20 among donors. So it's a very low ratio. So one of the key European players like France attaches not much attention uh, or not enough, in my view, attention to, uh, 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 to the specifically dealing with NGO world, directly dealing with the society, and supporting their own NGOs as well as NGOs in the country, uh, uh, beneficiary country, uh, to, to create a, a better condition for the, uh, for the growth of democracy. So we, we of course, through uh, a transatlantic dialogue, discuss now about the budget for defense. U.S. criticizes many European countries for uh, uh, declining their defense spendings. But let's start to talk about budgets for democracy support as well uh, in this context. And I, I, I would guess that the France would be the first a very good uh, target for U.S. administration to talk about this. So in a sense, there is a lot of issues uh, of, of different nature, uh, actual coordination on the ground, what we did uh, so successfully uh, with U.S., uh, during our dialogue, when the dialogue between Poland and U.S. produced concrete projects, but also concrete initiatives, strengthening community of democracy. So many layers, many aspects, and we should see it in this way. And the same, we can build a, a dialogue between Europe and United States, larger scale, much more, uh, much more bigger um, agenda. But coming back to, uh, uh, to the countries of, of future support, uh, I just want to share with you one of uh, uh, my recent experience visiting uh, uh, Cairo. Uh, as you know already, uh, across the region, there is a very common statement you would find in every forest and in internet. Our revolution was kidnapped. Our revolution was stolen. Those young guys are saying throughout their social media communication systems and websites and on the streets as well. And uh, we, we started to think, what does it mean? Uh, who stolen? Uh, uh, who, who did it to them? And when I talked to them, I understood that initial understanding, some people were trying to say that the Muslim Brotherhood had stolen a revolution from the young people. No, it's not the, the, the content of the message. The content of the message is, we young people are not represented. We did revolutions. We did revolution in Egypt specifically, and now old guys from all parties are negotiating the deal. We are not there. And that's a very interesting situation. When you look now uh, at the Egyptian situation from this point of view, you see this generational gap in, in, in leaders and elite, and then you look into the composition of NGOs and parties and administration, you would again see the very same division between youth and aged people. So that's a very strong driving factor that will lead us that those revolutions will repeat and repeat. The young people will not give up and they will ask for their place in a society. So today in Egypt, if we support NGOs, we support young people. 
And that is an extremely important element that should drive uh, international actions vis-a-vis -vis those uh, societies in order to really address what is the core of, uh, of, their, of their action, of their uh, of drive, and of their challenge uh, today. But I'm, I'm going to turn to Steve in just a second to put all of this together with us and help us think through what this all means we ought to be doing now. But let me throw out one ticklish question for the two people here who actually have to deal with policy at the moment, you and the U.S. government, and you still, to, to a certain extent, the Polish government and, and now in your transition. Uh, from the previous panel, the elephant in the room is Russia. Uh, you talked about even if 1%, even 1% cannot be left without support. But you also said it cannot be imposed from outside. Uh, the U.S. has many things we need from Russia, Afghanistan, Iran, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Poland does as well. How do you deal, uh, how important is democratization of Russia, and what does the U.S. and EU do together in this sort of situation? Maybe, Tomika, you could start. And let's keep this brief so we can get uh, to Steve very quickly, who I know would have thoughts on this as well. Well, we're obviously extremely concerned about the ongoing crackdown on civil society in Russia. It's unprecedented in both its scope and magnitude uh, in contemporary history. Uh, and we remain firmly committed to supporting civil society in that country. Uh, how we are able to do that uh, in the context of the, the new restrictions that are being put in place uh, is still something that we and I think our European partners are, are in the course of uh, determining. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, Mr. Pomianowski is absolutely right. Uh, there's a need for greater dialogue uh, within the transatlantic community uh, on how we can work to uh, support advocates for democracy, uh, not only in Russia, but in many other countries uh, where these restrictions are being imposed. Yeah, any thoughts on that, Yosef? Well, it's basically our joint concern. So in a sense, uh, uh, setting up uh, a more formalized dialogue especially uh, as we understand how, I mean, everybody understands how Europe works. First, Europe's dialogue within itself, and then needs to dialogue with the partners outside of it, of Europe. And, and, and this process of dialogue is imminent, is a, is, a, is, a, is a real process that builds Europe. So I think uh, uh, accepting uh, a permanent partner for such a type of dialogue would only bring uh, a good result. So that is something that, for me, uh, is obvious for today, but it doesn't mean it is easy to, to set up because still in, in Europe you would find many people that will be not ready for the dialogue on democracy support with the US, saying that the US model is not a European model and blah, blah, blah. You will find a lot of this kind of issues. Plus, as, as, as uh, uh, Tomajka touched uh, 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 issue uh, and you about uh, Russia, they are sensitive uh, 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 items uh, on this agenda where Europe and America can have a different approach. So, so Steve, Steve, you've done uh, a lot of work in this field. You've done a lot of thinking. Uh, why don't you give us your views on, in a, in a sort of general and principle-based way, but also uh, uh, how one would then exercise this in, in, in action? Well, you know, I think what's very interesting about this is the notion that there can and should be a dialogue between the United States and Europe on this subject. And what Poland, the United States, is doing, I think, really um, uh, points the way. So why hasn't that been the case? And I think, actually, the truth is democracy promotion has been a source of discord between the United States and Europe recently. And I think the explanation for that is clear. It has to do with Iraq and Afghanistan. And this notion that came in Europe that the United States was imposing democracy out of the barrel of the gun. Now, the truth is that the United States with other countries have changed regimes. We did it in Germany and Japan in World War II. We did it again in Afghanistan and Iraq. But the reason for that was always for national security concerns, not for democracy promotion. But having toppled regimes, the question always becomes, what do you own? owe to the people of those regimes. And being Americans, being Europeans, we always come down to say, well, we ought to help the people who freed themselves from authoritarians try to build their own kind of democracy. That's really what we owe them. That's what we, we do. We stand up for democracy and principles. And I think that we, we kind of, we lost sight of what really could be an area of cooperation because of the Iraq-Afghanistan 
experience and some misunderstanding of really what that was all about. I think that's behind us. I think now is a good time for us to have this, this dialogue because if you look at the principles on which the EU was founded and the principles on which the United States was founded, they all have democracy, pro, democracy, freedom, and rule of law at their core. So this is a natural area where we should be uh, cooperating. Uh, and, you know, Fred, one of the things for you to think about is that at next year's forum, do you want to attach to it a three- or four-day period where Europeans and Americans would come together and say, let's start this dialogue, maybe with government observers, <laughs> on uh, democracy promotion, what is a common set of principles and a common approach, and see, you, drawing on the U.S.-Polish experience, whether we can lead the way and, and prime the pump a little bit to this dialogue from outside. So if you want to have a, if part of that is to develop a list of principles, uh, in order to advance this proposition, let me run through what I would be on my list and, and see how close we are in terms of members of the panel. Um, again, people have to win their own freedom. You can't impose it from the outside by force of arms or otherwise. But even though people have to uh, develop their own democratic futures, we can help. We can help. And the United States and Europe already have some of the tools to do that. Training on how to conduct free and fair elections, training on political organization and party building. Um, uh, assisting in developing uh, a, a, a civic education in democracy and free markets, assistance in building a civil society, which is a bedrock foundation for democracy of freedom, and then, as Tamika mentioned, uh, building capacity in governments and societies so that they can provide security, economic prosperity, and services in a democratic framework, all important things, uh, all things that we know how to do, but quite frankly, we don't do very well because none of our societies have put the kind of resources in developing the civilian institutions that do these things uh, that is justified by the need. Um, let me make a, go to one other area where I think it's a little bit more difficult and where I think we need to have more discussion between Americans and Europeans, and that is helping people seeking their freedom before the tyrant is gone. It's a before tricky, the, before the tyrant and the authoritarian yeah. regime has been overturned. Because if you help folks from the outside, you put them at risk physically, and you run the risk of delegitimizing them by making them look like foreign agents. So what can you do? Uh, six or seven things. One. Get, use broadcast media, social media to get information into the society. Information, not only what's happening in the world, mm -hmm. but what is happening in their own societies, because many times the people fighting for freedom do not know. Secondly, and the U.S. government has begun to do this, and I'm, I'm very pleased by it, getting into people s struggling for their own freedom, the technical tools they need to be able to communicate and organize um, quietly and privately without being intruded upon uh, by the government. There are technologies that allow you to do, them, do this. We need to get them into the hands of people fighting for their own freedom. Make clear to people they're not alone. Make clear that we stand on the side of those who are seeking freedom for their country. Uh, encouraging them not to resort to violence, but using a civil resistance model. And particularly the flip side of that, using all our diplomatic pressure and media pressure on the governments to deter them from cracking down on those people peacefully seeking their own freedom so that you build some space in which they can operate free from government crackdown. Using very forcefully the principle that any government that uses force on their own people who are peacefully demonstrating has lost legitimacy. This is what many of us think we failed to do in 2009 in connection with the uprising in Iran. We need to not miss those opportunities in advance and find in the future. And finally, get involved early. And this is the lesson from Syria. What we've seen is when these opposition movement starts. They're usually, as Jersey mentioned, led by the young and led by the Democrats. And they're usually peaceful initially. 
But the longer they go, the more likely they go to violence, and the more likely the Democrats get to be replaced by authoritarians and then extremists who use violence as a tool. And your chance for a democratic outcome is reduced. So if we're going to get involved, get involved early when it's the Democrats out fight front and there's an opportunity to do it peacefully. Um, three things to leave you with. We've got to be humble. We've got to recognize our influence is limited. Our tools many times are inadequate. And we can only give people a start and assistance. They have to build their own democracy. We can't do it for them. Uh, and finally, we need to urge all of them to pay attention to the economics. Um, a democracy that does not produce economic progress and a better life is ultimately going to be discredited among its own people, no matter how many free and fair elections they conduct. So do the politics, but by heaven's sakes, we've got to do the economics. Because democracy is not only responds to the aspirations of the human spirit for freedom, but it is also believed, rightly, as the kind of system that produces economic prosperity and a better life. And we've got to make clear that that's, in fact, what happens. I, I think that's a very important statement, and I think we'll make sure there'll be a transcript of this whole uh, session on our website in time, and, and obviously this will be listed uh, live like the other things that, we, that you can go back and look at. Uh, but just before I go to the audience for questions, do either one of you have an immediate response to these principles? Would you embrace what uh, Steve Hadley just went through, or do you see issues in this that you would tweak or change or disagree with? Well, I would just add, uh, I, I fully agree um, with Stephen. What I would do just for the methodological uh, reason is just to, to divide a, a kind of set of principles for pre-democracy and the early consolidation of democracy uh, tools and, and, and the best practices. Obviously, the, the early uh, consolidation of democracy requires more work with the government and the pre-democracy requires more work directly with the society. So that's a, the, the differentiating factor which is very easy to, to be understood. And what you said about, uh, um, about uh, the, the mechanism, the instruments, the, the capacities that our societies must have also to take a part in this process. Because uh, again, uh, the second mistake we are committing is that the support for democracy, we are sending from government, either to government or to the civil society. And here is again the, 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 the second great issue and challenge. We need to make sure that in our own societies, there are partners and institutions and the civil society organization that are able to carry the work directly. Of course, we do have already them. We do have in Poland, we do have them in the United States, but that's another important capacity that needs to be Absolutely. well taken care. It cannot be done from the government level directly to the civil society in another country because that's exactly the, the moment where those accusation comes mm -hmm. like you are imposing something on us. To Michael. A few quick thoughts, and, and Steve gave us a, a lot of very good uh, points to respond to. Uh, the first, just on his idea that we can help, I think it's critical, critical for those in Europe and the United States to recognize that no nation in the history of our planet has ever gone through a transition to democracy purely on its own. Uh, and that goes for the United States as well. Uh, Yeji said some uh, perhaps not so kind things about France, but so I'll come to their defense. Uh, we wouldn't have made it uh, to where we are today uh, if they hadn't come to our well, side. Well, there were other European powers who were no, not yeah, so exactly. Wawski and Kościuszko <laughs> also played some role in this. And, and, uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And so I think it's important for us to yeah. realize we are, as you. democracies, we are co-defined, and we all have a stake in each other's success. Uh, and this is something that uh, we need to take very seriously, uh, because whether we like it or not, uh, we are all going to, to share in the results of this process. Uh, the other thing that I would mention briefly, just going back to, to Steve's uh, last point on, on the critical nature of outcomes, uh, is that in the past, I think we have occasionally focused too much simply on the processes of democracy. Uh, for example, elections. And elections are absolutely crucial. 
and yet at the same time, unless we are able to generate results that uh, actually give people a feeling that democracy is worth sacrifice and, and worth fighting for, we're not going to see uh, the long-term stability uh, that we should uh, as a result of these processes. Uh, and so we need to focus a lot more on the rule of law. We need to focus a lot more on institutional issues, not simply uh, the choreography uh, that goes along with carrying out free and fair elections every few years, although that's critical too. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, uh, the, um, without leading us too far astray, I'm going to ask one short question to Steve and then go to Yoshka Fisher. Okay, so we didn't get in early with Syria. What do we do now? Well, that's a much longer controver uh, and controversial conversation, but I would say that we are late, 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 maybe almost too late. Um, but the steps that the European, the EU has done in terms of lifting the arms embargo so that there is an option of providing assistance to some of the more democratic opposition forces is a good first step, and there are press reports today that the administration has now taken a decision uh, to work with groups like General Idris and provide them arms and assistance. Um, and it's important because uh, the battlefield is tipping, and it's tipping very much in favor of Assad. Um, he's now thinking about trying to take on Aleppo, and if he were to take back Aleppo, it would be a huge defeat for the opposition. So. What you've got to do, it, it, you know, it, it would be good for this to end up with some kind of an agreement in which all elements of Syrian society agree to build a new Syria. That's a great outcome. But you won't get it if the situation on the ground is so asymmetrical as it is now. Because Assad thinks there's no reason to leave since he's got support from the Iranians, the Russians, and Hezbollah, and he's winning. And the opposition says, sit down now from this position of weakness, we won't have any opportunities. So um, even if you, if you support the, the notion of some kind of negotiated outcome, which I do, that's got to be accompanied by something that levels the, the playing field a little bit on the ground. Because as it is now, we're being restrained, and the Russians, the Iranians, and Hezbollah are doubling down with Assad. That's not a sustainable situation. That is not a situation that will, that will produce peace. What it will produce is uh, you know, a protracted war, and this country has, has already had too much of that. Thank, thank you very much, Steve.